Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Lift Effect podcast. I am your host, Matt McNeil, founder, clinical director, and director of human performance at Lift Effect, where we assist professional pilots with maintaining better mental health and optimizing their mental skills. The goal of this podcast is simple to help pilots and other high liability professionals and disciplines come out of the shadows to discover how we can live better lives personally and professionally. Join us each episode as we discuss various topics ranging from mental health, mental skills and performance to business, entrepreneurship, and a few other surprises along the way. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest episode of the Lift Effect Podcast, where your host, Carl Keller, and the presentation maestro himself, Mac McNeil, uh, are here to bring you part two of a five-part series on integrity. Yeah. So real quick, Matt, because uh, we got a lot to cover, how was the, how was the presentation? I think it was good. I, I feel like it was favorable. It was a ton of information. Um, and I warned is, them, I said, lot. guys, this is going to be a ton and don't read the slides. Just close your eyes and listen and you can read the slides later. Um, but I wanted to give them everything. So I don't know whether that was good or bad. I kind of broke the rules of presentation. We we're supposed to keep it very simple and, you know, dope. but I was like, I got 90 minutes to, to give you five hours worth of hundred hours worth of material in a way yeah. that is useful to you. So. You know, we're only going to scratch the surface just in this five-part yeah. series yeah, as it is, yep. and this is considerably longer than that. So, yeah. Um, but but they got exposed to they it, got it, and they have the um the, the the slides so they can dig into it as they go along. Yes. So we're just going to cut right to the chase and go. Okay, let, uh, Matt, you want to do a quick recap of last week and yep. moving forward? So we are. Uh, this is our part two of. Um, it's going to end up being five parts for talking about integrity. And as we discussed last week, integrity is often associated with morals and ethics of don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, tell the truth, uh, do the right thing. And those are absolutely aspects of integrity. But I tried to lay out the hypothesis that integrity has, there there are many good people that don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal, but they they fall short. They They come up short in areas where they probably shouldn't come up short. They've had every opportunity to flourish and express the best of who they are, and yet they fall short. And we are all guilty of this. All of us can fall short. And my argument is that this actually comes down to deeper issues of integrity beyond just moral and ethics. And so that's what we're going to talk about is these 10 areas that I have gleaned from my mentors, from the research, from my own anecdotal experience of working with, you know, many uh, high achieving, good performing, very good people that feel as though they are, you know, have areas to improve on. And I I think it comes down to integrity. So what we talked about, we presented that as a hypothesis. And now let me, let me see if I can give you evidence to support this hypothesis that Integrity is more than just morals and, and ethics. Before we delved into the, the 10 aspects, we're going to cover two of them today, trust and truth. But I talked about the kind of the framework around solving for states of activation. And activation can be shame, it can be depression, it can be uh, anxiety, it can be worry, it can be stress, it can be conflict, it can be uh the temper issues, it doesn't matter. Anything where you're off your baseline is what I refer to as activation. Well, when we approach activation, we need to use strategies that are based, I believe, in how our brains actually work using neuroscience, because a lot of this is just mechanics. It's it's a brain issue. It's a mechanical issue of the brain. We, so we've got to approach things strategically using science. We need to decrease the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and our brains are wired to go into storytelling because they're 10,000 or you know, really 2 million years old, um, 1.8 million years old. That prefrontal cortex hasn't really evolved and a whole lot. And so it's, it's wired for the environment of a very hostile environment, which is saying, where is the tiger around the corner? That's a very adaptive 
response to have in that environment, but we haven't evolved very quickly and we don't actually live in that environment anymore. So our brains tend to over-exaggerate interpretations of what we think are truth to be able to protect ourselves from pain. We seek pleasure, we avoid pain, which we talked about the, the pleasure principle, which was Freud, he was great, he was right on that, is that we will do anything to uh, seek pleasure and avoid pain, even if it means denying the reality principle. The reality is in front of us and we just deny it and we go, no, 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 it's a threat, it's a threat. So that, we have to overcome that. We can do that by recognizing when we are going into story, much like stall recognition. You recognize when you're stalling, that's how you can actually recover from the stall. But if you don't recognize it, you're just going to be feel like you're dropping out of the sky for no reason. And so that's kind of when we drop out of the sky mentally, I think is when we're really engaged in the story, not realizing we're in the story. Going back to the present moment is how you can start to get out of the story. The present is like the attitude indicator. And then most importantly, we uh, ultimately, we have to manage our state, our mental state, which um, there's all these different theories on, on states. There's different, um, uh, you know, occurrent and standing, rational, irrational, zones of functioning, process outcome. There's all this theory around state, flow states. And uh, the way I like to think of it is, is like CRM perspective. Are we resourced or unresourced? When we're resourced, we're open, we're curious, we're committed to learning. And when we are in an unresourced state, we are closed. We become defensive because of that limbic brain. And then we become attached to committed to being right, despite the fact that we usually aren't right. It's usually not, but we're not fully right. And we could do a whole episode on uh, wrongology. But we are we are wrong way more than we are right, which is scary when you look at the the the, the science on it. It's it's kind of nuts. But that's the difference: closed, uh, you know, closed versus open, resource versus unresourced. We need to be in a resource state. State is about ninety five percent of the game. Story is like four. A strategy is one, and we usually reverse it. We think strategy is everything. We don't even recognize story and state. We're just in an we're just closed, defensive, and committed to being right. So. Okay, that's a mouthful, but that's the that's a quick review. Now let's get into a couple of of these these uh, personal makeup perspectives. So trust. Let's talk about trust. In a there's so I want you to we're going to approach all of these from either a resource state or an unresource state, and we all do this. So, but when trust is breached, that's an integrity breach. It's breached when we are unresourced. It is not breached when we are resourced. So let's look at what are some of these pieces here. So when we think about trust, when we are operating optimally in, a, in an open, curious, and committed to learning state, mental state, at the heart of that is our ability to express empathy. So think about we're trying to gain trust of somebody else. Empathy is the ability to enter into another person's experience. That's what being empathic is. And it's, it's not from a place where we're totally detached from our emotions. That's like, you know, you become kind of mechanical or guarded, but it's also not where you're going to make their issue yours. And this is what happens all the time when people express empathy is they're, they, you know, they're, we care so much, we can feel their, their their pain and we we our ego boundaries get stretched and all of a sudden we're making their experience ours and then before you know it right they're consoling you <laughs> which is you know it's a very human thing i mean and, and so being able to be to to instill trust from a resource places you can be empathic you can enter into their experience uh where you can f you know not be cut off from your emotions but you're but you're not making their issue become yours and so you're just and, and, and we've talked we've about talked that about where it. you were saying where basically we so often end up turning the conversation around where you you the goal is to help the other person and we end up talking about our issues that's right and all of a sudden it's about us and it's not some people it's intentional other people, they just do it and they don't even realize they've done it. That's why. Because the, the ego boundaries got stretched and all of a sudden you, you, 
their experience became yours because you're just so involved in the emotions of it. So it's that balance. You got to figure out how to balance that. But it's just listening in a way that communicates understanding and creates connection. That's the first piece. Second piece is validating. If you want to gain trust, you want to be in a resource place, you've got to validate. You got to see someone else's experience is valid in that it truly is their experience. It's not about right or wrong. You're not there to judge. You're just saying, this is their experience that they're that they're having. When we're the unresource, we invalidate other people's experience. And we can do that in a very subversive kind of way where it's not meant to be hurtful, but it is invalidating. Like, oh, it's not that bad, or don't worry about it. It's not, it's, that's actually in, invalidating. That doesn't engender trust. It actually ends up, dis- it's like you're discounting the issue. It's not, and, and, and all you're doing is shutting them down and making, it, and making that, that connection so much harder. That's right. It makes the connection much harder. You got to have some vulnerability. Now, this is tough a lot for a lot of guys, especially in these sort of type A machismo kind of uh, uh, positions that this being vulnerable, you, if you are not vulnerable, you will not gain trust because th- you become unapproachable. There's this, oh, that's the statue, the big heroic you know, Adonis statue. I'm not, I'm not that. And so then there's this gap. So vulnerability, now strength and power are essential to be, to being able to gain trust. If, if you have no strength and you have no power, no one's going to trust you, but not so much that others can't understand or relate to you. And that's where vulnerability allows this bridge of connection. You don't want it to come across as, oh, that only only happened to you, but never me. Mm -hmm. Again, it just, it creates a wall, uh, uh, an unnecessary one. Yes, it's it's exactly. These are all barriers, right? So you got to have empathy, validation, you got to have vulnerability. And then there has to be a need, right? A willingness to express uh, uh, a need to improve engenders trust. And that is where I think when, when we're thinking about improvement, it's, uh, I've had one of my, Henry Cloud, one of my mentors, he, he says, go hard at the problem, not at the person. And so if you go hard on the problem, um, or hard on, excuse me, hard on the person, that can actually shut people down. Now, it doesn't mean you can't coach them, you can't lead them to performance, you can't encourage them, but <coughs> going hard at the problem is allows you to approach the need, right? There's a need here, there's a willingness to improve performance. Let's go hard on the problem and maybe a little bit softer on the person. Um, that is how you engender trust. It, it's more about the issues, like you say, because people can feel like they're being attacked personally and that again disoffensive another barrier another obstacle it's about the problem and we're here to to kind of either allow them to see what it is or get them on the right path or provide some insight or help but yeah when you start turning it on them again even though this conversation is towards them not about you you want it to be on the problem like you say otherwise it it all these things it's so easy to create these barriers it's just amazing there's Sometimes I almost feel like it's amazing we actually get through to some people sometimes when you're trying to help because everything's there set up to be an obstacle. Yep, that's right. That's right. So trust, you have to engender trust. If they don't trust you, and again, remember, if we're looking at just morals and ethics, that's like, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. That's baseline. Yeah, you need that. But sometimes really good people they don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal. They're ethical. They have uh, integrity, but they can't engender trust. There's a lack of trust because they don't express empathy. They're not. They're invalidating. They do not make themselves vulnerable. Right. That's kind of the do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> you know. Um, and then there's this. They go hard on the person and not on the problem, which then creates a lack of of really willingness to express need to improve. So that's the first element. You got to engender trust and just ask yourself, am I resourced or unresourced in this? If you're unresourced, 
you're invalidating the other's experience and you go against the person, not the problem. If you're resourced, you got empathy, validation, being having expressing some vulner, vulnerability so others can understand and relate to you. And then there's a need of, of improvement at the problem, which then I think by proxy actually improves the person. So, okay. So that's trust. Um, one last thing I want to yes. say is one of the worst words you can use in my, in my experience, and again, mine's not it's just me, is the word weak. Oh, yeah. You know, because all of a sudden you've denigrated them, you've cut them down. You know, you're, you're basically talking down to them. Um, like I said, the, people don't want to be here. They don't want to be in that position. And it's not always through weakness. Yeah. But when you say those words, it's just, again, that to me, that's probably the biggest single yeah. barrier because you've lost them. In, in an aviation, yeah. that is a term that's used constantly is, yes, you know, is. how's your FO or how's your captain? People say weak, you know, which means the skills. And I, so I don't like in, 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 in performance psychology, we never say that. The only thing we ever say is needs work. Needs work. It's okay. Hey, this is good. This was good. This needs work. Not that was weak. There's a, it's just a, yeah, it's a, it's a terrible thing that becomes acculturated even into professional culture and pilot culture. It's huge. This is how the skills weak or strong, you know? And so I think that is, you know, when you're working with somebody and trying to get the best out of them or trying to help them improve, you do not say you're weak. That that does that is not helpful. I just prefer needs work. All right. Second, let's talk about truth. Um. So, good ethical people of integrity they they tell the truth. It's not like they're just bald faced lying. That's a lack of integrity. And people do it. Doesn't mean that they're horrible people doesn't mean they're awful people it just means there's something else going on in them and and they they lie and so th that happens but when you're in a resourced place being truthful is the ability to give a representation of reality to others uh, as best as it's understood in the moment that's why i love like the scientific method it's you're never right right? There's no like proof. It's only disprove, right? You're like, okay, well, uh, we, we know this didn't work. Is that the way it is? We don't know, but we know what doesn't work. We only disprove. You don't prove anything because it's reality evolves. So truth to represent truth from a resource places, you're just giving a representation as best as it's understood. It's the ability to like not miss parts of reality that are important to making things work. And uh, so I view that as like uh, cherry picking. We don't cherry pick pieces of the truth to say, well, this is the truth. Just say, this is what is best we understand. We're not going to miss parts of it. I think the key moment that you just said, though, is in at that at moment. At that moment. In, at, at that, that moment. moment being in present. And, and and it's one of the most important things I've learned when I'm talking to you. It we're not trying to past tense it or future tense yep. it. It's what we know at that at moment. that moment. That's so important. That's the most important part of that piece there because you take that part out and it it, it, it kind of loses. The, it's it's meaning. That's right. So when we're and now when we're unresourced, people of integrity that need to improve on integrity around truth when they're unresourced is i think it's not that they're lying but there's an avoidance of seeking the truth that's when we're not really acting in integrity we're just like uh you know it's kind of the proverbial bury your head in the sand let's avoid seeking the truth that's that's closed defensive and committed to being right when we're open curious and committed to learning we're not we're, we're just re representing it as we as we best understand it in the moment we're not going to miss parts of it. And, and this is important. The truth has to be good enough. Despite what you think, what you want, maybe even what you're led by others to believe, I think the truth is it is what it is. It's a willingness to say it is what it is. May not be what I want. It might not be what everybody's yelling. No, no, no. This is the truth. This is the, you know, this is the, you know, the, the moon landings are hoaxed or whatever. 
it's like it it just is what it is when you're re a quick analogy yeah if you don't yeah. mind um, this is uh, this is something i've told my kids I, I i said you know we can always look and go what are we making the best decision i think most of the time only in hindsight will we know the, the key is the, usually we know we usually have multiple of options. One of them is clearly bad. The others are varying degrees of better. As long as you don't take the pick the bad one, there's only future will tell you whether you did it good yeah. or not. You can't beat yourself up in the future going, well, why didn't I pick that one? If you had that information, then you would have. Yep. You can't beat yourself up. And I think too many people end up looking back and the, they look at their past experiences going, and they start doubting and they start adding all this confusion and confusing factors because, God, the last time I should have picked that one. And every time I do, I always pick the wrong one. No, you just didn't pick the best one. Now, if you outright picked the wrong one and you knew it, that's a different story. But I think so many people look at their past experiences and use that as the, to cause confusion in that moment mm -hmm. because why didn't I pick the best one? Yeah, and that's that it kind of leads to the perfectionism piece a little bit and it's like when i think about like decision making when you got to make a decision it's like just make a decision it's it doesn't have to be the best one because it's sometimes you don't know you don't have enough to know and some of it's unpredictable just don't choose the worst one try Absolutely. not to choose the worst one if it's like yeah you know what we chose this and it kind of created some downstream effects that weren't optimal uh, that weren't ideal but it was you know it's fine it's okay. You use what you got, but when you, I just, I got to get it perfect every time. That's this inability. I would say you're operating from a closed, defensive, and committed to being right perspective, which is unresourced. This is unconscious. Yes. And in the in the world of 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 leadership, they call it unconscious leadership. When you're unconscious, you're closed, defensive, and you're I got to be right. That's unconscious. Yep. And just about every scenario, there is no perfect answer. Everyone has got some drawback, just some are bigger than others. So when we're looking for the perfect is, I think you, we've talked about it. Perfect is the enemy of good. Yep. I agree. So then where do you seek truth? When you're resourced, you seek it out via the external world, right? You, it's like, okay, I'm going to look outside myself. You got to look then at yourself as well, internal themselves, external internal and and then others that's where you seek it out you can't just be like no i'm only getting it from my own thoughts or i'm only getting it from my own inside closed group or i'm only getting it from the external world you've got to use the world themselves and others that's where it's 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 sought out um you've got to be able to monitor if you're in a resourced place of truth seeking you got to be able to monitor your own thoughts, your own behaviors, your own feelings. Because if you don't, you don't there, there's no allowance for self-correction. So you you have to monitor, you know, your behavior. <laughs> what am I doing here? Why am I why, how am I getting reactive on this? I feel like I'm getting upset here or I'm I'm doing these, some of these kind of screwy decisions with my behavior. What's going on here? So you've got to self-monitor if you want to be able to self-correct. Now, here's a huge one. Uh, this one's massive. You have good leaders, people of really good integrity around truth. They have the ability to neutralize the truth, which means they embrace the negative. They embrace the positive. They don't, th there's no like black or white. It's, oh, it's so amazing. It's sort of the manic, you know, the truth is just, this is just the best or everything is crap. You know, the, 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 the halo effect or just everything is, is, is negative. When people are unresourced, they view things as people are either black or white. It's a good guy. That's a bad guy. That's a good, that was a good thing. That was a bad decision. Resource means you neutralize it. You're like, yeah, this is, it's just, it's almost like fair and balanced reporting. There's no emotion around it. It's just reporting what, what is happening without leaning too much in one way or too much in the other. Like you say, activated. If people look back, they can probably see a common thread in their act when they're in an activated state, what upsets them, what gets them yeah. angry. And so 
if you look at it and go, well, there's a common thread in these events. And you have two options, I think. One is to avoid it because sometimes uh, you can avoid whatever it is that activates you. And if it, you can't avoid it, understand that it's going to happen and you're already kind of halfway to kind of preparing yourself to make sure you limit the interaction or how you respond to it versus just walking into it and then, you know, like maybe your child does a certain thing and it always kind of gets you frustrated or angry. There's things you can do, but I think most people walk in and they aren't thinking about it and all of a sudden they let their emotions go when it's really a very common recurring issue. Yep, that's right. So what we could, what, the one thing we could do, um, we could uh, summarize this. The, it's when you're, when you're able to see the positive and the negative, in psychologists, they call this the ability to see whole representations of people, of situations. It's neither good, it's, it's neither all good, it's neither all bad, it's just aspects of both. It's seeing the whole representation. There's some good, here's where it needs work. When we're not, we do as they call it, psychologists call it splitting. People are good or bad, it's a splitting. So resourced, whole representations, unresourced, splitting. When you're resourced around truth, you can, uh, you can assimilate and accommodate, which means you have openness to new information, the ability to sort of synthesize it, assimilate it, and then make some changes as a result from it. Assimilate and accommodate. The opposite of that, I think, is represented through arrogance, pride, anxiety and fear we're arrogant when we're prideful anxious for we don't assimilate accommodate we're just like there's no openness there's there's no ability to shift and make changes it's just it's like ramp it's like running through a wall without taking in the information so that is the essence i think of am i am i resourced or am i unresourced around truth can I give whole representations of reality as best it's understood? Can we can we make uh, without you know cherry picking pieces of reality to make the truth? It's all of it. It's and it's it's good enough. It's not about what you think or necessarily what you want, what other people tell you. It's just it is what it is. Can you self monitor your own thoughts and behaviors and to allow for correction? Can you neutralize it? Right? Just it's not. Oh, it's so great or it's so awful. It's just it's neutral. You see whole representations of people, and then you can assimilate and accommodate so that you can get new information, synthesize it, and then make changes as a result from it as you move ahead. That is where you are absolutely above the line in a resourced, open, curious, committed to learning state. One of the best things I ever learned, it sounds crazy when I say it, but it was so simple. At my former airline, or at my airline, that's a former, at my airline, they said, and it's one of the best things they've ever said, I think, was it's not about who's right, it's what's right. When you look at what's right, you take the emotion out of it and you take the ownership out of it. Who cares who's right as long as we get what's right, right? Yeah. My, my former airline, it was just, you need to always be truthful. Tell the truth. If you tell the truth, we'll back you. If you don't tell the truth, you're gone. And the truth has to be good enough. It's got to be good enough. But you can nuance this. You can get deeper into how do I work with truth? Am I operating from, a, from an open or a closed state? Am I resourced or unresourced around it? We all can make improvements to this. I mean, there's all times where we avoid seeking truth or we think things are black or white or we become sort of arrogant around it and prideful or just fearful around it. And so that's just a, a, some perspective. So trust. And truth are the first two of this Big Ten makeup. And I think we'll stop for there. Uh, Carl, what's the big thing? What do you take away? For me, the big takeaway, and again, it's, it, it is being in the moment to understand how things are, not how you want them to be or what caused them to happen. They, they've happened. You are where you are, and you have to look at it and it's like look at yourself in the mirror and go this is this is the truth don't make it so that you you know think you're better or worse than you are this is where you are and when you start looking at it from a, an objective perspective 
you take that emotional piece out of it, you take that um, ownership out of it, and you start looking at, okay, here's where I'm at. What do I need to do? Or here's where you're at. And like you say, these are things that need to be worked on. It, it, whether it's on you or whether you're someone t- you're talking to someone, it's it's not about ownership. And I think if you can look at it those two ways, you and and you're honestly pr- always coming at it from that perspective. Most of those barriers that are there will recede or not even come into the play because they realize this is coming from a place of honesty and objectivity, not emotional, not possessive, not uh, demeaning. That's what my takeaway is. I think it's a good takeaway. So yeah, looking forward to continuing our discussion. We're still going to, we're going to cover a lot more over the next few podcasts over the next few weeks. I have a question for you. This is going to be out of the left field, and it goes back to your presentation the other day. Uh, you had talked about you had quite a few questions. Was there a kind of a recurring theme on the questions, or were they just all, all over the, map? Over the curious, place? There was no focus on any one area? No, it was all over the place, which was interesting. But it's like, what do yeah, people connect with? a lot of with, times you, you know? see a common thread. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, was, I mean, it, it was... Um, yeah, I'll have to go back and look at it. It'll be viewed. You I'm can just view curious because yeah. you always wonder what resonates or what impacts a cr- an audience uh, when you know, because obviously it sounds like there were a lot of questions, so they were very. There engaged. was, a, I mean, I only left seven minutes for questions because it took that long <laughs> to get through everything. So I only got to mm-hmm. a few, um, but you know, it's like, is there a difference between? But it sounded like there were a lot of hands raised. The, <laughs> there, well, yeah, they they type in their questions, so it comes across oh, the screen. They? Yeah, you can't they, you can't call on people. Um, cause it's just, there's too but big of a place <laughs> and it, yeah, but it was, it was like, you know, one of them was, is there a difference between men and women in their brains and how they, you know, <laughs> and I thought that was really funny. I, I, I got a kick out of that. Um, you know, yeah, there's just, I can't, I don't even want to get into it, but I'm, I'm looking right, forward to, curious. yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing our exploration around deeper aspects of integrity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that will cover it for today. This is the second of five parts. We've touched on the first few. We've got uh, quite a few more to go. So this is a very complex and um, large topic to to cover. So please stay uh, tuned for parts three through five. We thank you. We're glad that you're here. Um, If you want more and want more in depth, please Uh, consider looking at our subscriber feed. Until then, we thank you and we look forward to seeing you on our next podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Lift Effect Podcast. If you want to dive deeper into this episode and every episode, go to our website, lifteffect.com forward slash podcast. If you're enjoying the show, we would love it if you'd follow us on Spotify and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your support. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, all with the ID Matthew McNeil. This show is brought to you by Lift Effect, a clinical mental health and consulting company that assists air carriers, corporate flight departments, pilot unions, and commercial pilots by providing comprehensive psychotherapy and mental skills coaching services to pilots with mental health and mental performance related issues. Visit lifteffect.com, that's L-I-F-T-A-F-F-E-C-T.com to book your free consultation. And finally, this podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of counseling, psychotherapy, medicine, or any other health care service, including the giving of medical advice. No therapeutic or provider-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and any materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining advice for any psychological or medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Lift Effect podcast.